It's my pleasure to welcome you to worship here at Aylmer Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us. May you be drawn into his presence and be built up and encouraged in your faith as we worship together. Later on in the service, we will be joining in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. We invite all who know Jesus as their Savior to share with us in that remembrance of his death. So please have your juice and bread and juice ready for that communion service. Let's hear the words of scripture from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for us. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with a harp, with a harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains ring together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of coming together to worship you. Thank you that we are your children through your Son, Jesus. We come into your presence today in his name and because of his work for us on the cross. Thank you that because of Jesus we can come boldly, not hesitantly or fearfully, because we know how much you love us. Be with us through this time of worship and be glorified through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 8, 7, and 9, the Apostle Paul writes, Just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. When we give, we follow the example of Jesus who gave his all for us. Thank you for your generous and sacrificial giving to the work of Aylmer Baptist Church. May God bless you as you give. At the end of the service, you will find we see ways in which you can contribute to the work of Aylmer Baptist Church. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have blessed us so that we may be a blessing. Thank you that you have given to us so that we may give. Accept these tithes and offerings with our love. Use both the gift and the giver 
For your glory we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I brought some but not by a pair of binoculars I've been looking through them and th seeing what I can see see through them but what I'm really looking for is Jesus and I can't seem to find him through these binoculars do you think these binoculars will help me find Jesus well it's sometimes it's hard to uh, hard to imagine what Jesus would, would look like or where we can find him but the Bible tells us where we can see Jesus in Matthew 25, verse 40, it says, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anything you did for any of my people here, you also did for me. And he's thinking about people who visit those who are sick or heal those who are sick, visit those who are in prison, help those who are less fortunate, feed the hungry. Jesus says that anytime we do something for someone else, it's as though we are doing it for him. And I wonder, have you ever seen anybody who, who needs some help? Um, maybe someone who's uh, stuck on the side of the road. Maybe it's somebody who forgot their lunch when, when they went to school and they need something to eat. Maybe it's somebody who's sick and they need to be, they need to be visited. So maybe it's, it's somebody who doesn't have as many clothes as you do and you can share with them. Well, Jesus says when we help people like that, it's as though we are helping him. And so we want, if we want to see Jesus, all we have to do is look around us and see people who need our help. And when we help them, it's as though we are helping Jesus himself. Now, um, it's not always easy to, uh, to treat people well. Um, some people have short tempers. Some people are always getting angry. Some people be, behave badly and are strangely and are embarrassing. Or maybe we see somebody who's who's hungry, but we really don't feel like sharing because we know we've just got enough for enough for ourselves for our, for our own lunch. We may be we may we may get tired of of helping other people, but Jesus says that it's very important that we do help because when we help others, it's as though we are helping Him, and when we help others, we can see Jesus in them, and they can see Jesus in us. In other parts of the Bible, Jesus says that we are his hands and we are his feet. Nobody, People may not be able to see him except what they see in us and what we're doing. Be behaving in ways that allow others to see Jesus in us is one of the most important things that we can do with our lives. And I hope that each one of us will try to be like Jesus in the way that we deal with people, the way that we are concerned about people, the way that we help people. Binoculars won't help people see Jesus, but you will. The first scripture reading is from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 25. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. The Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. 
So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the res resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. The second scripture reading is from John chapter 11 verses 38 to 44. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go.
broken hearted sing We have seen God's glory We have seen Him dead and raised to life We'll worship Him forever We have seen God's glory Jesus Christ There they are again The witnesses of Jesus take their stand May it never end Through us let God keep stretching out his hand Reaching those who doubt Touching those who cry Lifting up the word of God As we testify Walking with our God in such a living way that when we share our faith in him we can truly say we have seen God's glory we've lived and walked with Christ the King we've seen him heal the wounded we've heard the broken heart has seen dead are raised to life we'll worship him forever we have seen god's glory we have seen god's glory we have seen god's glory jesus christ We've seen him heal the wounded and heard the broken heart and sing. We have seen God's glory. We who once were dead are raised to life. We'll worship him for. Let's pray together. We come into your presence today, our Father, acknowledging our weakness and frailty while remembering your greatness and power. We remember the words of Isaiah 44, 6-7. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and the last. Apart from me there is no God. In verse 24, I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. You alone are worthy of worship because you are almighty, and it amazes us that you would deign to have a relationship with us and call us your children. You are majestic in holiness. You are the one who is worthy of being called God. We confess to you that we have not always lived as you want us to live, we confess that our human nature is prone to yield to temptation, so we often fall. We confess that we have done things and thought things and said things that do not honor you or our relationship with you. And we pray for your forgiveness and the strength to resist temptation when we encounter it. 
Help us to live the holy and righteous li- lives that will demonstrate to those around us that we have, a, have had a life-changing encounter and a relationship with your son, Jesus. Today, we thank you for Jesus, for the sacrifice he made for us on the cross. We thank you for forgiveness of sin and the assurance of eternal life. Thank you for the assurance that beyond the trials and tribulations of life here on earth, there is a wonderful, perfect eternity awaiting us. Thank you for the hope and encouragement that these truths bring during the challenges that we face. Thank you for your presence and provision through the challenges of this current pandemic. Thank you for your protection. We thank you that we can always count on you. Thank you for the way you provide for us on a daily basis. Thank you for our families, our homes, our occupations. Thank you for the food you provide, and we pray for those who do not, who are not as fortunate as we are. We thank you for our country, and pray that those who give leadership will be guided by the principles of your word and the truths upon which our nation was founded. Thank you for Aylmer Baptist Church and the way you have guided this congregation to the selection of a new pastor. We pray for that relationship, that there will be much fruit from the ministry in this place. We pray today for your continued protection. We pray for an end to this pandemic and an end to restrictions so that once that we may once again worship and serve together. We pray for the effectiveness of the vaccines and for those who are making decisions. We pray for those who are sick, the shut-ins, those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray for caregivers and frontline workers. Give them strength and perseverance. We pray for our missionaries that their ministries will bear much fruit for you. We pray for the town of Aylmer and that the light of the gospel as it shines through Aylmer Baptist Church will draw people to Jesus. We pray for Michelle and Mary Ellen Belzeal as they prepare for ministry and new life in Aylmer. Bless their preparations and their move, and we pray for a fruitful ministry in this place. Thank you once again for the love you have shown us through Jesus. Thank you for your constant presence with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. Be with us to the remainder of this service. Speak to us Build us up and be glorified through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 11, we find one of Jesus' most well-known I am statements. You hear it at almost every funeral service. In verse 25, he's standing with Martha at the tomb of her beloved brother Lazarus, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now, at the time, it probably didn't make much sense to Martha. Um, Her brother had been one of Jesus' best friends, and when he'd gotten sick, she and her sister Mary had sent a message to Jesus saying that the one he loved was sick. There was a apparently a special friendship or bond between uh, Jesus and Lazarus. So Martha, while she was very thankful for Jesus' presence with her at that traumatic time, must have wondered what he meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, will live even though he dies. Because after all, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Decomposition had already started. He was dead, and humanly speaking, there was no hope that he was going to come back to life. But this episode in in Jesus' ministry enabled him to teach his disciples and us about his mission to the earth. It also enabled him to, uh, to give a foreshadowing or a picture of the great miracle of his own resurrection that was soon to come. You know, the central message of the early church was the resurrection. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 7, that the message he passed on to the Corinthians was of first importance, and it was that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he says that the resurrection of Jesus was authentic- authenticated by his appearance to Peter then to the 12 disciples, and then to more than 500 brothers, then to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all to him, Paul, personally. 
And later on in the same chapter, Paul says that if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So the importance of the resurrection cannot be under understated or underestimated. It's crucial to our faith. And in John chapter 11, in claiming to be the resurrection and the life, Jesus was laying claim to being the one of whom Isaiah 26, 19 and Daniel 12, verse 2 spoke. Isaiah says, but your, your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Daniel says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. So Jesus in John 11 was claiming to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. He was claiming to be the one who would fulfill the resurrection promises of the Old Testament. But more, much more than this, the story of the raising of Lazarus gives us some other lessons that we can learn. The first lesson we can learn is that Jesus is the one on whom we can call when we have no place else to turn. Mary and Martha, we're told, sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, we don't know if, uh, they, if, if when they sent this message, they knew how sick Lazarus really was. We don't know if when they sent this message, whether he was at death's door or not. It may have been that he was very sick, and his uh, sisters thought that if Jesus wanted to see him again while he was still alive, he should come quickly. But then again, and this is my personal preference, they may have known that, Jesus was, that Lazarus was dying, and they realized that only Jesus could help, that Jesus was the only one who could help them. They had exhausted all the usual resources. They'd probably consulted the local doctor, if there was one. They'd administered the usual remedies. They'd prayed for their brother, but they watched as he got sicker and sicker, so they called Jesus. He was their last resort. And apparently they had such a close relationship with Jesus that they realized there was something special and unusual about him. They may have witnessed or heard about the miracles of healing that Jesus had performed. And they saw Lazarus and realized that without Jesus there was no hope, and so they sent for him to come. But unfortunately, Lazarus went downhill very quickly, and he was undoubtedly dead even before Jesus got the message. In fact, Jesus told his disciples directly that Lazarus was dead. And strangely enough, when Jesus got the message, he didn't rush to help his friends. Instead, he told his disciples, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And then he waited two more days before leaving to go to, to, go to Bethany. Now, his disciples were, at the time, were horrified that he would even consider go, returning to such a dangerous part of the country because Jesus' life had been threatened there. And the disciples thought that he should stay as far away from Bethany as he possibly could, even though his friends were in need. But Jesus told them that his friend Lazarus had fallen asleep and he was going back to wake him up. Now, of course, the disciples, being thick-headed, really didn't understand what Jesus was me meaning. Jesus had to tell them in no uncertain words that, G that Lazarus had died. And then he said the most amazing and enigmatic thing. He told them that he was glad Lazarus had died because this gave him the opportunity to prove that he was the one that he claimed to be. He said to his disciples, my friend Lazarus is, is asleep. No, not really asleep, he's dead. And I'm glad he's dead because this gives me the opportunity of showing you or demonstrating to you that I really am who I say I am. And of course, Jesus knew all along that this is what would happen. Supernaturally, he had known that Lazarus had died. And when the sisters had sent word to him, uh, they, must, they must have expected that their brother would still be alive long enough for Jesus to come and heal him. But Jesus knew that death had occurred, 
And he knew that Lazarus' death had gave him the opportunity to prove that he was the Lord of both the dead, of the, both the living and the dead. He was Lord of life and death. It gave him the opportunity of proving once and for all that the miracles that he'd performed were not flukes or happy coincidences. Lazarus' dead death gave Jesus the opportunity for, for, to decisively demonstrate that he was the Messiah, the Savior they had been waiting for. But Lazarus' death also gave Jesus the opportunity of demonstrating that when the situation seems hopeless, there is always hope with him. When the situation seems hopeless, there is always hope with Jesus. This tragedy gave Jesus the opportunity to show Mary and Martha and the disciples and everyone else that with him hope is available and there is always, there is always hope. And that's a wonderful message for each of us. When earthly resources and helpers fail us, Jesus is always there and he's powerful. He can do things that no one else can do. He can perform miracles. Now, a miracle is something that goes against the natural course of events. A miracle is not supposed to be something that you expect. If we could expect miracles, they wouldn't be called miracles. They would be called ordinaries. A miracle is God stepping into this world and doing something that is unexpected or out of the ordinary. And miracles come in answer to prayer. Miracles come in answer to asking God. Before she died, my, my mother gave me a little book called Miracles Can Happen. And it's full of stories of miracles that have, occur, that have happened in the recent and not so recent past. And one of the stories in this book is about a man who in 1994 went diving in the Pacific Ocean somewhere off the coast of Mexico. And as he was swimming, his foot became wedged in coral. He couldn't set himself free. And the story begins like this. The man at the bottom of the sea had not long to live, and he knew it. He was trapped, foot wedged in razor-sharp coral, and his lungs were bursting. As he thrashed around, frantically trying to free himself, the crystal-clear water became clouded with crimson as blood seeped from lacerations. The pain he felt was numbed by the fear of dying. And yet a strange calm began to flood his mind. Soon, his mouth would be forced open as he gasped for air that he knew did not exist in this place. Then the ocean would consume him, filling his lungs, choking, suffocating, drowning. But as he opened his mouth to scream, something happened to him, something that he may never fully understand. He started to breathe. Six hours later, a rescue launch found his boat, and the two men entered the water to look for the corpse. They found him trapped in coral, but there was something strange. He didn't look dead. His eyes were closed as if he was, was sleeping. Most corpses they had found at the bottom of the ocean had their eyes wide open, wide open with fear before they died. They cut him free from the coral and got him back to the surface where they lifted him into the boat. He landed face down on the deck. But before the younger man could get into the boat himself, the older man screamed and jumped back as the drowned man twitched and then coughed. He coughed again and then opened his eyes and sat up. He told them that except for a few cuts and bruises on his foot, he felt fine. And from the stopwatch he had left on the boat when he first entered the water, they learned that he'd been in the water for an amazing six hours and three minutes. It was a miracle. But what they didn't know at the time was that the man's wife had felt uneasy and she'd prayed, God, if he's in some kind of trouble, please keep him safe. Send your angels to watch over him. I don't know what's going on, God, but I feel he needs you now, really needs you to be with him, help him, save him. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And when she arrived at the hospital where they'd taken her husband, he said to her, I saw you praying for me. I thought I was going to die, and then I must have fallen asleep and had a dream. I saw you sitting on the bed in the hotel room praying. There were angels in the room with you, angels with wings. 
And she responded, I guess God wasn't taking any chances if he sent angels. Well, the amazing thing about this story is that while the wife was a devoted Christian, the man had lost his faith in God. Why? Because he had been the son of a pastor, and that pastor and his wife had both lost their lives in a car crash, and the son could not understand how a good God could let that happen to his faithful servant. But that miracle in the Pacific Ocean was an instrument that God used to bring that man back to faith. And the story illustrates that the fact that when there is no one else to, we can turn to, Jesus is available. Mary and Martha knew it. That wife knew it. And it's a lesson that we need to learn. When we're at the end of the rope, when there seems to be no one who can help, Jesus is there and we can turn to him, especially in times of serious illness or accident, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. If he could bring back to life dead Lazarus, if he could save that man from drowning even though he was underwater for six hours, shouldn't we be able to trust him with the most serious crisis situations of our lives? There's a second lesson we can learn from this, le this story in Jesus' life. Jesus is willing to put himself at risk for those he loves. Jesus is willing to put himself at risk for those he loves. When, when Jesus announced his intention to return to Bethany in response to Mary and Martha's message, the disciples tried to talk him out of it. It wasn't safe. His life had been threatened. The Jews had tried to stone him. But Jesus' mind was made up. Mary and Martha and Lazarus needed him, and personal risk was no reason to not go to them. He was willing to put himself at risk to help his friends to go and wake up Lazarus from the sleep of death. And as a result of the miracle that was performed, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and Martha put their faith in Jesus. And that angered the religious leaders, and they put their heads together. And in verse, in verse 53 says, that from that day on, they plotted to take his life. It seems so strange that someone who could perform such a marvelous miracle could be so hated. We would think that Jesus would have been lauded as a hero. But that was all part of God's plan. But what this demonstrates is the lengths to which Jesus is willing to go to help us. The length he was willing to go to help Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And it's a, foreshad it's a foreshadowing of the extent to which he would go to help us. Because that same Jesus who risked his life to go back to a dangerous situation or a different dangerous place to help Lazarus was willing to actually give his life for us on the cross. And reminds us of the events of Palm Sunday that's coming up in just a very few weeks. Because when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey foal, knowing that he was going to a very dangerous place, knowing that he was going to his death, he went, well, he went anyway. It's a picture of how much he loves us. The same Jesus who went back to dangerous territory to bring Lazarus back from the grave came to this harsh, cruel, dangerous world, willing to lay down his life for us on the cross. In 1 Peter 2, 21, Peter writes, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on, in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you have been healed. This shows us or tells us how much Jesus loves us. But Peter also says that Jesus stands as an example to us of the commitment we need 
to have to see, we need to have to see that God's work and will is done. In the same way that Jesus went into dangerous situations in order to provide salvation and eternal life for us, we need to be willing to take risks to do His work. And there are risks associated with being servants of Jesus. So often we've heard of missionaries who have been mistreated and beaten and even killed because of their commitment to tell other people about Jesus. Last year, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ lost a a great man of God, Ravi Zacharias. I was privileged to be a graduate of one of the same schools that Ravi Zacharias attended. And his teaching will be greatly missed. He was one of the great apologists of our day. And a while ago, I read, read his book, Cries of the Heart, and was interested to read a story about, about a fellow, another fellow I remember from Bible college. His name was Kos Fiji. And he went to Thailand as a missionary with Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And Ravi, and, and Ravi Zacharias and Kos Fiji uh, got together in Bangkok in 1974 and talked throughout the night about how God was leading in their lives and of his call to be faithful. And Ravi says that he could tell that Kos was really troubled And as they parted, he repeated what he had said a few times, that perhaps he would pay with his life for his boldness of his witness for Christ. And Ravi says, sure enough, I would not see Kos again. A few short years later, as he was coming out of a prayer meeting in the city where he ministered, a man shot him to death at point-blank range. Even though he knew that missionary work was dangerous, Kos Fiji would not allow that to keep him from doing the work that he knew he had been called to do. He boldly followed Jesus' footsteps, who journeyed into dangerous territory to raise Lazarus, and then into dangerous Jerusalem, where he knew the cross that would provide salvation for us awaited him. Service for Jesus involves risk. But like Jesus, we need to be willing to take that risk and be obedient. Without the willingness to take risks, it's impossible to be faithful. And there's a a third lesson from this passage of Scripture, this story of the raising of Lazarus. It's a picture of what happens to us by faith. The raising of Lazarus is a picture of what happens to us by faith. After declaring to Martha that he is the resurrection and the life, and the, only one who, and, the, and the one who believes in him will live even though he dies, Jesus went to the tomb where Lazarus had been laid. He told them to take the stone away from the door. Now Martha, ever the practical one, protested because after four days there would be a strong odor of decay. But Jesus insisted and told her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And then once the stone was gone, he first prayed, and then he called out, Lazarus, come out. And somehow, we're not sure how, Lazarus was able to come out of the tomb, even though he would have been tightly wrapped in strips of linen. It was a great miracle. But it's also a picture of what happens to those who receive Jesus as their Savior by faith. It's a picture of Jesus' declaration that he is the resurrection and the life. Because when a person comes to faith in Jesus, they're forgiven of their sin, and they are raised from deadness in sin to new life in Christ. It's as though when you receive Jesus as your Savior by faith, you hear the words, come out. Come out of your lostness. Come out of the tomb you were in. And without Jesus, we were in a tomb. We may have not been there physically, but we were certainly there spiritually. Without Jesus, we were lost. We were dead in our sins. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And later on in that chapter, Paul says this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him even in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. 
When we come to, to Jesus and receive him by faith, it's as though we not only hear the words, come out, come out of your lostness, come out of your alienation, come out of the tomb you're in, but also Jesus is calling us, come out to new life, eternal life. Get rid of the grave clothes you're wearing. Be clothed in eternal garments. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. It's a startling statement because Jesus means that he is the only one who can provide resurrection and life. He's the only one who can bring people back to life when they are dead in sin. He's the only one who can save people from their deadness in sin and give eternal life. Now, in some ways, it's a confusing statement full of contradictions. You have to look at it spiritually or it really doesn't make sense. Because Jesus says, whoever believes in him will live even though he dies. Well, how can that be? Normally, we think when you're dead, you're dead. But of course, Jesus means that when we believe in him, even though we may die physically, we are alive spiritually. In fact, we are more alive than we've ever been before because we're with him in heaven. And then he says, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This doesn't mean that we will never have to face physical death until Jesus returns to this earth and abolishes physical death. Every one of us will die. Our time on earth is short. But physical death does not mean the end of spiritual life. If we believe in Jesus, we can be sure that spiritual life will go on for eternity. We have to remember that in the, the Bible, we think of both the physical and the spiritual sides of, of life and death. Sin brought both physical and spiritual death into the world. When Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sinned, their bodies grew old and eventually they died. That's happened to everyone or almost everyone ever since, ever since with the exception of Enoch and Elijah who were taken bodily to be with God. But since, entered, sin, but since sin entered the world, we've also faced spiritual death, which is separation and alienation from the God who created us. And Adam and Eve experienced that separation from God. They hid, hid themselves in the garden. They said they were afraid. Their relationship with God had been marred or broken because of the sin that they committed. And we are there, the inheritance, inheritors of that same kind of separation. But Jesus came to, the earth, came to die on the cross so that both physical and spiritual death could be done away with. So at some time in the future, there will be no more death. In Revelation 20, 14, it tells us that in John's vision, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And chapter 21, verse 4 says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Jesus is the one who came to make sure that the new order of things will indeed happen. He came to someday make physical death a thing of the past and to make sure that spiritual death or separation from God doesn't have to happen to us. Even though we may die physically, we can be very sure that we will live eternally. Let's be grateful that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and remember that he is powerful. He is always available to help. Let's remember how much he loves us and then show our love for him. And let's give thanks for what he can do for us when we come to him in faith. That through him, though we may die, we will live because he is the resurrection and the life. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We're thankful, Father, that even though we may die physically, we can know that we will live eternally with you in those uh, mansions that Jesus is pre preparing for us even now. We're thankful, Father, for this spectacular miracle that Jesus performed in Bethany, the raising of Lazarus, for the lessons that it teaches us, for the hope that it gives to us, 
We're thankful, Father, that Jesus is available to us no matter what situation of life we may find ourselves in, even COVID-19. We're thankful that Jesus is with us. We're thankful, Father, that Jesus was willing to come into this dangerous world to give himself on the cross for us, that he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for us, to make, uh, make the assurance of forgiveness of sin and eternal life a reality. So, Father, we pray that we might follow Jesus' example and be, uh, be willing to, to risk comfort, perhaps even risk our lives for his sake and for the extension of his kingdom. Father, help us to be bold in our witness, and we pray, our Father, that every day we will rejoice in the resurrection life that we have received through him. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we've come together to obey the command of Christ and to share in this sacred memorial to our Lord's death. All those who know Jesus as their Savior by faith and show by their actions and their testimony that he is the Lord of their life may share in this remembrance. This is not our table, but it is Christ's table. Let's read the words of institutions recorded by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. Let us follow the example of our Lord as we give thanks. Good morning, God. We believe in you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, your only son, our Lord, who gave his life freely because of your grace, the honor and favor of love for us. He was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He was betrayed by his own, as he said he would be. Yet on the night before, gathered around a table, he broke bread and drank with them and prayed. All his pain and suffering and humiliation to save us. 
your love for us, your grace to give us eternal life. You're not only in our hearts and on our minds, but also on our lips. As we go forth reminded of our salvation, glory be to you, Father, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, without end. Amen. After supper, Jesus took the bread, and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood given for you for the remission of sins. Drink this to remember me. So we pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the gift of your son Jesus, for the sacrifice that he made for us. We're thankful for his broken body, for his shed blood. They were given for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we, as we have taken these elements, we pray that they will become more and more precious to us and that Jesus will become more and more precious to us every day. And Father, we pray that we will live to honor the sacrifice that he made. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.